I do not for one minute pretend to doubt your sincerity in singing that to the Lord, nor mine. And yet, sometimes when we come to a hard point in life, we might not trust the process. We might not trust the outcome. We might not even trust that there is someone standing there with us. But here's what I want you to know. You're not alone. You are not alone. You have someone standing closer than a brother to you. And so sing that song with confidence. And should you at some point begin to doubt, turn around and sing it again. I surrender all to a trustworthy God, to an all-knowing, to an all-wise God. I surrender all because I have an advocate. So you're not alone. You have an advocate. Let me share with you a story about a defense attorney. I came across this interesting story about a legendary lawyer by the name of Sir Lionel Lacou. He was a flamboyant Guyanese barrister. He died at the age of 83, and he was listed in the Guinness Book of World Records as the world's most successful advocate. With 245 consecutive successful defenses in murder cases. I'd say that's pretty successful. He was known as the Perry Mason of the Caribbean. He served as a distinguished diplomat and became a justice in his country's highest court. He was knighted twice by Queen Elizabeth. Here's the exciting part. In his own spiritual journey, Laku turned his expertise to the question of whether the resurrection of Jesus Christ fit the test of legal evidence. Here's the conclusion that he ultimately reached. He says, in his own words, I say unequivocally that the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so overwhelming that it compels acceptance by proof, which leaves absolutely no room for doubt. Absolutely no room for doubt. Here's the rest of the story. In his spiritual journey, he was invited to a full gospel businessman's luncheon at his, in his country, and he was invited to surrender his life, to surrender his all to Jesus Christ, which he gladly accepted. He became a follower of Christ, an ambassador for Christ. Let me just say this. No one comes down from a Roman cross alive, including Jesus. As Laku would say, the proof of his resurrection leaves absolutely no room for doubt. We have even a better defense attorney than Laku. His name is Jesus Christ. He is your defender. He is your sword and shield. He is your righteousness at your right hand. That is Christ. He is your advocate. You know, we've been uh, studying 1 John 1. And Lord, I just pray right now, would you open the eyes of our heart? Would you help us, Lord God, to hear your Holy Spirit and what you would say to us? Our situations are different, but our needs are the same. We need an advocate. We need a savior. We need a counselor. We need a friend. And so, Lord, would you just open our heart, help us to truly surrender all, and understand we are not alone. Thank you, Lord. We've been studying 1 John, and, and in chapter 1, um, it describes God is a God of light. He is light. Those who fellowship with him do not walk in sin or darkness. Because we must walk, we must live, we must... Do all things in the light that God has provided us. That's where the opportunities come from. In what God has already provided. We receive fellowship. We receive cleansing in the blood of Jesus Christ. We receive our freedom from sin and so much more. It's a full life. If we truly dare to walk in it, it's a full life. 
John focuses on the seriousness of sin and its consequences of broken fellowship with God and with others. Mm -hmm. So let's go on to chapter 2, because he expands on this thought of how Jesus, the greatest defense attorney of all times, works on our behalf. Yeah. He stands before the Father working on your behalf. That, uh, that should cause us to go, hallelujah! Yeah. Seriously. You see, the Christian who wants to make progress in their spiritual life, for them, nothing is demoralizing as sin. John lays out this chapter to emphasize that a believer has no business sinning. It's demoralizing. But when we do, we have one who will help. One who is our defense. Sometimes we berate ourselves. We beat ourselves. We excuse ourselves. And then we question the ability of God to forgive us because we think we're so bad. We can't forgive ourselves. So why, after all, would he forgive us? And Satan, our enemy, uses this to his advantage. He wants to keep us down. He wants to entice us to wallow in despair and defeat. Those are not fruits of the Spirit, just in case you didn't know, right? Joy, love, goodness. We can wallow in those, but it's not wallowing then, is it? We rejoice in those. A true believer in Jesus Christ must rely on him. Must rely on the words here. That's why it's so important to read it. Just when you're in the midst of crud, who recalls what you haven't read? Who recalls what you don't know? No one. We have focused on that. We must recall, we must focus on the works done by Christ. And then we must depend on Holy Spirit to walk us through and to remind us, to quicken us in really tough times. When all of this is in order, when, you know, when we rely on him and all those things I just mentioned, then we can walk in the light as he is light. We can help others to walk in the light and in turn experience the freedom that is found in one who overcomes. Don't you want to be an overcoming Christian who walks in freedom and, and helps others to walk in freedom and to see freedom and to see it's a possibility even? Amen. Amen walk in the light. Hebrews 9.24 says this. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Mm -hmm. I stumbled because did you see that's in English Standard Version? Mm -hmm. It says almost exactly the same thing, but I have it written out here in a different version, and I'm not asking you to change it, Dan, so don't worry about it. But let me just say, Christ did not enter a holy place made with human hands. Mm -hmm. Christ entered a place made by God himself, yeah. because he is God. Yeah. He entered into heaven, and now he appears in the presence of his Father for us, for your behalf. This is what John is talking about. Christ being our advocate. Let's turn to 1 John chapter 2. And we're going to work a little bit through 1 John. Verse 1 says, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Wow. John has so much love for the church. The church. Not one church, not his church, but the church. Mm -hmm. He has so much love for them. For those who truly love Jesus Christ as their Savior. It wasn't always this way. You remember him when he walked with Jesus. He and his brother James. Jesus named them sons of thunder for a reason. He wasn't always full of love. Jesus always called him beloved. You know, Jesus calls us. 
our true nature before we ever begin to walk in it. Have you thought about that? It's like a calling forth of the personality that God has planted inside. Beloved John. He has so much love for the church now. For those who love and trust Jesus, there's an ever-increasing amount of love for his people. As we grow in the love of God, as we grow in, in our worship towards God, we grow in our love for God's people. We can't get away from it because what's important to the object of our love becomes important to us. So we can't get away from it if we truly love God. <laughs> So John here, he's speaking with such affection. I tell you, my mother-in-law has a special name for all of the kids. She would refer to them as Blossom. Even when you were a kid, she would refer to you as Blossom, her little Blossom. It spoke volumes to their hearts because each one of them knew Grandma B was a safe place. It didn't matter what their life looked like at the time. It didn't matter how they acted. It didn't matter how they looked. She called forth in them that they were a beautiful blossom coming to full bloom. It was amazing for them. I remember during COVID, you know, we had 12 people at our house. I've talked about that before. We will have more this summer because now we're having our 10th grandchild. So... Pray for me. <laughs> That's in August. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, when we had our house full of people and kids, I would say to my grandkids, come here, my love. I'll do that for you. It's true. I really do love them. But sometimes in the midst of things, you have to remind yourself, I love you. <laughs> you know, when you're going through things, you have to say, my love, so that you can remind yourself how much you love and value and cherish that other individual. And this is not just about children. This can be learned in marriages. My love. My darlings. You know, that's what John is saying here. He's saying, my little children, my darlings, the object <laughs> of my affection. I love you so much. With the Father's love, I love you so much. He says, I want you to know, I value you. You belong to me. You belong in my heart. There's a place for you. You're not alone. And you know why John can do that so easily? Because it wasn't based on human love. It was based on the Father's love. You see, when we base everything on the Father's love, we can purely love one another. Yeah. It doesn't matter if someone has frustrated us. I love you. You are my beloved. You are my darling. You are my blossom. You are my love. It doesn't matter. And we all need to understand there is intrinsic value within because we are made in God's image. Nothing can steal that from us. But we can frustrate that love of God within us. We can frustrate that value of God within us by the things that we think and the things that we do, by sin itself. That's why we need one another. Love is a true hallmark of Christianity. You know, a hallmark, it's that stamp that's put in a piece of gold, silver, platinum. And it certifies the standard of purity. Love, pure love, is a hallmark of Christianity. Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. And John writes in 1 John 4, verse 19, that we love because he first loved us. Yeah. Now, this is nothing like the sappy Hallmark movies where you know the actors, you've seen them before, you know the storyline, and you know how it's going to end. And you still watch it. Yeah, it's nothing like that. God's love is certifiably 100% pure, saturated love. It is undiluted pure and saturated love. And as we walk imperfectly in the light of who God is, we sometimes step in the muck and mud of sin. We're made of dust. Sometimes we walk in the wet dust. You know? 
even though we say, I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to take that bait again, and you can't push my button again. Oops. We just do. Two years ago, I probably shared this story before, but uh, two years ago, our granddaughter had a goal to learn how to shoot a bow and arrow. So she went out there, and we got her a bow and arrow, and she went out there, and she's shooting and shooting and shooting, and it's going here, it's going there, it's going in the dirt, it's going everywhere except the target. Everywhere but the bullseye. Don't you feel sometimes that your life is like, <laughs> like that? Oh, God, I'm trying my best, you know? And then all of a sudden, it goes veering off to the left. So I went out, and I took the bow and the arrow in my hand, and I shot a perfect bullseye. She's like, <laughs> well, if you can do it, I can do it. And she sat there and practiced, and she did. It, that's all sin is, is missing the target of God. So often we get defeated because we miss the target and we refuse to ask for help. Seriously, what's wrong with us? We refuse to ask for help. And I'm talking to myself, you know? Like, I'm probably the last one to ask for help, right? We should know better. And John says, you stop that back there. <laughs> My husband's back there going, mm-hmm, that's true. <laughs> oh, honestly. 40 years in July. Ooh. Yeah. But John says, we have an advocate with the Father. Why don't we ever ask the advocate to defend our case? Why don't we ever ask that? John's saying, that includes me. He says, we. We have an advocate. I'm including myself. I need an advocate too, John says. Now, Honestly, he's walked with the Lord for 50 plus years. And he needs an advocate? He still doesn't have it right? Although for some of you, that should be a wake-up call saying, okay, I'll just continue. I'll just continue. And for some of you, you might say, oh, well, this is possible then to keep walking with the Lord for 50 plus years, even if I stumble. See, he is Jesus Christ, the righteous. And an advocate works on our behalf. They're called, God has called Jesus to walk beside us. God. That's who he is. No matter what it is we need, he is our advocate. He works on our behalf. The Greek word is parakletos. It's the same word that is used for Holy Spirit. Mm. He acts as an intercessor. He acts as a consoler. He acts as a counselor. You know, when our friend's wife left him, they had a child, and they had to try and figure out this custody thing. And, and so the, the judge appointed a guardian ad litem, an advocate, who spoke to a bunch of us and came up with something that uh, would help the judge in his decision about where the child should go. Now, guardian ad litems are human like us. They don't always make the right decision. Um, and the judge has to have discernment. But Jesus Christ always makes the right decision about you. He always advocates right, rightly for you. He doesn't make mistakes. He can be trusted. The Father has called and appointed him to advocate your case before God, the righteous judge. Honestly, he will do that. And then it says in verse 2, And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. You know, we use words that sometimes we don't understand. We'll throw them out because we've memorized something. But really, all this means is that God had a standard. <coughs> and Jesus fulfilled every aspect of that standard. Jesus satisfied the requirement of God. The shed blood of Jesus is the atonement that was needed for our sin. Okay, those are all words that work together. His death on the cross, 
His shed blood fulfilled the requirement of sin once and for all. You see, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins, no forgiveness of sins. Blood had to be shed. That's why we remember the shed blood of Christ in the communion that we take. That's why we remember the shed blood of Christ at Easter time or Resurrection Sunday. You know, this is a personal and a corporate benefit. God sees the needs of the individual as well as the needs of the whole. And when Jesus advocates for you, he's not saying you're innocent. He's not saying you're without blame. When he advocates for you before the Father, he's saying, this has been paid in full. That's what he's doing. He's not saying, well, judge, you should be lenient because, you know, they've been a good citizen this long. He's saying, yeah, I paid the price. I paid the price. I paid the price. He advocates for you, and it's perfect. Sometimes we deceive ourselves. We believe, oh, man, I'm just not good enough for him. He might have done that for that person. Or, you know, you see that person over there? Man, they don't even know how to pray. Yeah, they're forgiven. Oh, oh but that person, they always, always read their Bible. But me, oh, I'm unforgivable. No, <clears throat> that's not what the scripture says. That's not what John is saying. He's saying, it's been paid in full, and I'm going to advocate on your behalf because you're my child. You are my darling. You are my love. That's what he says. Martin Luther reminds us. You see here he says, John says, mm, he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. And Martin Luther reminds us, you are a part of the world, the whole world. So just because you're not a disciple or an apostle or whatever, you're not a pastor, you're not a, you know, whatever, you are a part of that. It's more than enough for you. So out of that, we need to walk as Christ walked, right? Let's go on to verse 3. By this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I've come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this, we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. If we say we're in Christ, we walk as though we're in Christ. We must be a person without guile. Now, again, we might step in the muck, but he's there. So we need to remember that. Even this week, this exhortation is coming to pass. I've been ministering to others and through tragedy, and, and God really does say, yes, yes, I am for you. He says, amen, I made you, and I will advocate for you. But we need to guard our core. That's our job, is to guard who we are at the core of our being. See, after a violent storm one night, a large tree, which over the years had become a stately giant, this happened to Steve and, and uh, Joyce just a few years ago. The, this tree was found lying across the pathway in a park. Theirs was across their roof. Nothing but a splintered stump was left. Closer examination showed that it was rotten at the core. Completely rotten at the core. Because thousands of tiny insects had eaten away at its heart. The weakness of that tree was not brought on by the sudden storm. It began the very moment the first insect began to eat away and nest in its bark. With the Holy Spirit, let us be very careful to guard or to keep God's prescription or his injunction for living. 
Sometimes we call that his commandments. Mm -hmm. According to John Calvin, the writer John, here in the book, does not mean that those who wholly satisfy the law keep his commandments. There's no such instance that can be found in the world. Not one of us can perfectly keep all ten of his commandments. But he's saying it's those who strive, it's those who work according to the capacity of their human infirmity to form their life of obedience in God. He's saying, how much are you striving to be like Christ? How much are you practicing spiritual discipline so that you know who Christ is? So that you can walk according to the light as he is the light. That's what he's saying. Believers don't follow a set of rules and regulations in order to be forgiven. No. It's because we're forgiven that it's a joy to obey the command of God. It's not a have to. It's a desire to. It's a want to. I want to be pleasing to God because he has saved me. Yeah. So we guard the life of Christ within us by keeping his word. We show the truth of who God is through our love for others. Cosmos will be here next Sunday as I announced. He was at Northern Lakes Church in Nevis last Wednesday. And he's in Monaga this morning. Um, Rick and I went on Wednesday. And he spoke on the verse, Who do you say I am? He stressed how our life shows the reality of who we believe Jesus Christ to be. If he is first in our life, we live our life accordingly. But if he's not first, our life suffers. Because we're living according to what we put first in our lives. So really, we must all turn our eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face. Because then the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We tend to look and act like those we live with. Think about it. John is emphatically calling the believers to make Christ the highest value in their lives. Everything else will fall into place. If Jesus Christ is our highest priority, if we understand what he did for us, if we understand that he is our advocate, everything else falls into place. We get things in order. Go to seven. Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment, but which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. On the other hand, I'm writing to you a new commandment, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The one who says he is in the light yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light, and there's no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness. He does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. See, Jesus prayed that the disciples would be united as one because he and the Father are one. Unity is a result of the bond of love. True love doesn't ask, what can I gain from you? True love says, how can I value you so much that our relationship adds ever-increasing value? Disunity steals value. Unity adds value. Disunity is darkness, and unity is love. Jesus walked in unity with his Father. He yielded his life wholly. He not only is our Savior, but he is our righteousness and he is our example for righteous living. The one who loves his brother abides. He lives in, he eats, he sleeps, he breathes, he abides in the light, he abides in Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the light of the world. That's what Jesus said. And when we abide, when we live in, when we eat, when we sleep, when we breathe in Christ, there's no cause for stumbling. There's no cause for sin. 
Let me just tell you about the lighthouse. A friend told us that he was visiting a lighthouse lately. And he said to the keeper, aren't you afraid to live in here? You know, lighthouses are a little creepy. They sit all alone. He said, this is a dreadful place to be in constantly. But the light keeper replied, no, I'm not afraid. We never think of ourselves here. Never think of yourselves. How is that? And you never think about being safe in these strong storms and winds? No. We know perfectly well we're safe. And we, our only thought is to have our lamps burning brightly mm -hmm. and keeping the reflectors clear so that those in danger might be saved. This is what we ought to do as Christians. Honestly, keep our reflectors clear and our lamps burning brightly. This is what we should be doing. We're granted freedom to overcome. Why wouldn't we share that freedom with others? Mm. Verse 12. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven you in his name's sake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I'm writing you, young men, because you've overcome the evil one. I've written to you, children, because you know the Father. I've written to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I've written to you, young men, because you are strong. And the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. John is writing to every believer in the church. He's writing to his dear children who had experienced forgiveness through Jesus. Some were mature in faith. Others struggled with temptations and life demands, and they've won. Still others had learned about Jesus, and they were just beginning on this journey. Every person in the church needs to grow. We need to grow in Christ. We need to grow in our love for one another. As children learn about Christ, they grow in their ability to win battles over temptation. As young adults, they move from victory to victory. They grow in their relationship with Christ. Older adults, having known Christ for years, actually have something they can share with those coming up under them. The ability to teach. Now, I'm not talking about chronological age. I'm talking about spiritual maturity. When we're able to help others come up, it continues the cycle. It keeps the cycle going. One of the greatest privileges I have is to drive our granddaughter to school each day. Um, I know that the Jacobsons have a devotional that they keep in the car and they read and they pray and, and on their way to school, and we do that as well. <coughs> it's a great time to be able to talk about God's creation, to be able to talk about their day, to be able to pray for them, you know, um, and to send them off on their way. As we continue to work out our salvation, simply forming habits, and learning what it is to continually grow in Christ and walk in Christ, then we experience the freedom to overcome all obstacles. I'm just going to conclude with this, just some questions that you can ponder, that you can think about. Because honestly, we each need to be sober-minded. We need to look at our spiritual life. We need to examine it, not for the purpose of feeling bad, but for the purpose of saying, God, you've brought me thus far. How do we continue going further? That's the whole point of spiritual introspection. We need to take inventory. We need to ask ourselves the hard questions. <clears throat> so ask yourself, is my century on duty? Am I guarding well God's commands? If love is the hallmark of Christianity, what would my mark reveal? Is my purity level 90% Christian, 50% pure? Does my life even show love toward God and others? <clears throat> How quick am I to forgive? How quick am I to believe that 
I'm God's darling. And I know it depends on the day. And I know it depends on the moment of the day. Let's continue to remind ourselves what he says about me and embrace that truth. What he says about you and embrace that truth. If I were a lighthouse keeper, what would my lighthouse say about me? Do I move in fear or do I move in faith? Jesus Christ, your advocate, your friend, your deliverer. Who do you say he is? Will you turn your eyes to him, look in his face, and allow the things of this earth to grow dim? Father, you have given us so much to think about, so much to ponder. You've given us so many truths through your scripture. We are weak. We don't always believe what we read and hear, Lord. But we want to step out in faith and we want to say, I believe. Help us, help me in my unbelief. Help me to see that you truly do have my best interest at heart. That you truly are my advocate. That you truly are my deliverer. And then, Lord, out of that revelation, may my light shine brighter than even the lighthouse. Yes, May I help others to hear and to see and to know you. Extend your grace, Lord, that we may walk in.